Good evening, everybody. I hope you're all doing well. I hope you're having as much fun as I am going through the book of First John. It's so absolutely amazing. Um, this is class number eight. We're in uh, First John chapter four. I'm going to back up a little bit because I just want to go over something that I wasn't sure I had time for last time, so I want to try to catch it this time. So we're going to go looking back at, at verse seven. So, you know, up to now in chapter four, we've been seeing this theme uh, we've talked about um, the things that that were summarized um, in chapter 3, and then in chapter 4 we talked about false prophets, but more than anything we just talked about the mutual indwelling. God in me, and me in him, Jesus in me, and me in him, that we're all of God. Well, <coughs> forgive me, one of the products of that is that we overcome. And so when we look at verse 9, um, or excuse me, verse 4, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. I just want to look at overcome a little bit, and it's in your notes. Um, John sixteen thirty three says this, these things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Notice that the first one to overcome is Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 3, verse 1, talks about it in a little different way. What advantage then has the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way. Chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. I mean, they had the word of God. Other people did not. For what if some didn't believe? What if some of the Jews didn't believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God of no effect? God forbid. Let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, that you might be justified in thy sayings and might overcome when you are judged. So one of the key things to overcoming is let the word be the word. If you haven't learned anything else in these classes, it's that the word of God is what you want to concentrate on. The word of God provides its own context. The word of God provides its own story. Yes, there are lots of interesting historical things, lots of interesting pieces of information that you can glean from other things that are in the world. But if it needed to be said, it's in the word of God. Everything that you need to know for life and for overcoming is in the word. Romans 12, 21 says to overcome with evil with good. We're going to get, see in, in 1 John chapter 5 how this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Um, and, but we're going to read a couple others in Revelation 21, verse 6 is one of the most outstanding scriptures on this subject that overcoming is important. Because remember what we're talking about. Don't like to ever lose sight of it. You've overcome them. Who have you, who have you overcome? Well, you've overcome all the false prophets. You've overcome all the ones that are the antichrists is what we're going to find out. You're going to overcome all those that do not confess that Jesus Christ is in me. You're going to overcome the ones that don't understand the mutual indwelling that we have as a free gift given to us by God when we acknowledge him, call upon his name, and are born again. And don't forget that that's the context of all of this. And in this overcoming, in, Re in Revelation 21, 6, he says this, And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is thirsty of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God. Notice, he's going to give you of the fountain of the water of life freely. You now have that. If you overcome, you inherit all things. I'll be his God. He'll be my son. But the fearful, I want to see that word coming up later. It's one of the reasons we want to talk about this one. An unbelieving and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Oh, terrible. Absolutely terrible. Listen to the scripture, though. Listen to the parts of it. Jesus said, I have finished. I've done it all. If you're thirsty, I will freely give you the water of life. You call upon me, you'll be saved. You ask of me, I will give you to drink. It's the same thing. Now that you've received that, he that overcomes inherits all things. But all the ones who choose to do evil, they will not. You know one of the greatest powers that will keep you from evil, besides the fact you have the Holy Ghost to lead you, besides the fact that you have God 
himself and Jesus himself praying for you and working with you. But I mean, one of the greatest powers they've given you to overcome evil is to recognize that Jesus is in you. When you recognize that Jesus is in you, do you want to make Jesus and link him with a harlot? Do you want to take Jesus and link him with a lie? No. When you acknowledge that Jesus is in you and you're in him, oh, that gives you great power, gives you great motivation, gives you great authority to walk free, to walk free. So I just wanted to catch that from last time because then we're going to move into class number eight and talk about verse 10 of First John uh, chapter 4, which we're going to try to finish tonight. Okay, so we're going to live through Jesus. And here is love. We want to define love because we just set up here, verse 7, let us love one another. Verse 9, and this was manifested the love of God towards us because he sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. John three sixteen. Herein then, let me help you to understand what love is. Herein is love. Not that we loved God. Oh my but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the, the, the means of forgiveness for our sins. He came to be the one that would just expunge our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Now notice the context here. He sent him to take our sin away. We were in rebellion against God. We were in sin and darkness. And he sent his son to take us away. Even while we were yet sinners, it says in Romans, Christ died for us. He sent his son because he loved us. Though we were his enemies, he loved us. Though the world hated him, he sent his only begotten son. So here's love. This is what he did. Beloved, we ought to love one another. Listen to that in the same way. That means laying down your lives for one another. That means love covers a multitude of sins. That means that love is always looking to restore. Love is never looking to cast out. Love is not looking to dis discard. You know, it, uh, Paul's example is so incredible. Here's this man committing sin that, that they couldn't even hardly find people who took their father's wife in the Old Testament or in, in, in any place in the world that couldn't find that, but they were finding it in the church and accepting it as normal. And Paul said, cast him out. And then in the second Corinthians, it talks about how the man repented and cried out to God and was restored. That's That's love. So we, that we understand. But we got to love one another, lay down our lives to see people set free. So 1 John um, 4.19, we're going to see that we love him because he first loved us. So we'll get to there. Let's read this one in Revelation 1.5. From Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Redemption is something that Jesus does. When you redeem something, the something you're redeeming has nothing to do with the program. When he redeemed us, when he bought us back, when he paid the price for our sins, it had nothing to do with any works of righteousness that we have done. And nothing to do with that. We need to understand that we were in need of a Savior, and he saved us. So to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. This word, he says, the propitiation for our sins. We're going to talk about that word a little bit so that we just make sure we understand this better. It can be better said, or said maybe in a way that we understand it today a little better, the means of forgiveness. Jesus is the one who is the one who does this work. I want you to keep in mind here with these scriptures, it's what he did. The redemption, and redemption, as, as we mentioned, just mentioned to you, redemption is something that God does and redeems us. It has nothing to do with what we have done. The redemption which is in Christ has nothing to do with what we offer. We don't bring the sacrifice to God and therefore we're redeemed. We accept what he offered. He offers the sacrifice. If you want to know a little bit more about that, I put a note in your notes to look at note 97 in Pastor Mark's commentary 
on 1 John 4.10 because he goes into the Greek a little bit. And you know that I've said many times, I'm not really a linguist. And, you know, I can, I can pretend to be one and play one on TV, but I, I'm not that good at feeling confident that I know what I'm talking about. I can only tell you what somebody else writes. Um, but just to give you a little flavor of this, he starts out with the Greek word hilosmos is roughly equivalent to the Hebrew word kipper. And that's a huge word, huge word in Hebrew. Um, and it's translated in our English Bibles, at least in the King James, as often as atonement, okay, which is a word that was created to try to convey the meaning of what this was, because there just wasn't a good word in English for it. And it's, you know, it's bringing back into close um, relationship the at one meant idea. So it's, 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 that's the idea that's taking the, the relationship that was broken and restoring and bringing it back into it. And so then he'll go on and talk about this in very great detail. It's a great note to just spend some time in, look up all the scriptures, really, really study that note and understand what that word means, um, the propitiation. Because people read over this so fast because it's the only time it's really mentioned here. And it's understanding that the what love is, is when God... I think it's not said any better than it's said in Romans. When we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He did that. He loved us so that we could be brought back into fellowship with him. And that's a work that Jesus Christ did. And we need to follow the example that he gave us of doing that very, very same thing doesn't mean that I'm going to go get nailed on a cross to pay for your sins, because that isn't going to happen. That's not what I mean. What I mean is that you lay down your life for one another. You take up your cross and you follow Jesus, meaning that you don't choose your own way, but you choose his, meaning that you don't do what you want to do, but you do what he wants you to do. And I'm sure all of us have stories of things that we've done in our past or whatever, where we've had to make choices and we've chosen to follow Jesus, even seemingly to our own detriment. It, it, you know, by the statements of the world, people in the world might look at it and go, how could you do that? You're, you're choosing to leave all this behind to follow after something that, you know, you can get that another way. You don't have to do that. You know, you'll hear those. And we all have stories, but, you know, that is a daily thing that we do. Forgetting those things that are behind Forgetting everything that we had in the past, forgetting everything that we, quote, gave up, you know, just not really a good way to say it. Everything that we chose not to go in the way of the world or in our own way and we chose to go in God's way. Forgetting all even of that. Today we press on. Today we do what Jesus did. We live the life of Jesus where he gave his life for those around him. That is love. Herein is love. <clears throat> not that we love God. It's not, it's not what we did. It's what he did. That is love. So, Colossians 3.14 says this. Above all things, all the things that he's talking about in that chapter, put on charity or love, which is the bond of perfectness. Be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. You want the bond to perfect? You want to what holds perfectness together? It's love. Put on love. Here's another reminder. 1 Thessalonians 4, nine. but as touching brotherly love, you don't need that I write unto you. Remember this? For you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. We talked about what you're taught and what you know. You, you don't have anybody who needs to teach you because you know all things. We know what God did for us. We know that he called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Back in chapter 3, you'll remember this scripture. Here's how we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives to the brethren. It's saying the exact same thing as the scripture is saying. 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all things, have fervent love among yourselves. For love shall cover the multitude of sins. In Ephesians 5, 2. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor so walk in love as christ has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to god there you go this is the call 
This is, this is what you're called to, to love like he loved, to lay down your life, to not look to the things of yourself, but look to the things of another, to not look to the things that you want for you, but to look to the things that somebody else has need of. Primarily, of all things, is that all men might be saved, that all men might come into this knowledge of God, of the grace of God, and receive the oneness that has been freely given the water of life that's been given freely, the new life that's been given freely, the born-again life that is given to us because of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus and the sins that have been taken away because all the sin is taken away by his blood. You might remember that from back in um, uh, um, 1, 7, chapter 1, verse 7. It's the blood that cleanses from all sin. Got it? Well, so there we are. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about love here. We haven't talked about it enough. Verse 12, no man has seen God at any time. Let's stop there for a moment. This is a very tough place for people. Because if you go read the Old Testament, it's very evident that Abraham saw God, that Moses talked to God face to face, that there are many other appearances of God to people. Some, you know, it might be hard to be certain, but I mean, when we look at Abraham, that one's clear. Three men come walking to him. He immediately, he's, he's the Lord. He's talking to him as the Lord. He's bowing down before him as the Lord. He's not, this is not just, just some angel per se. This is God himself that shows up. And I've heard it said that that's all three members of the Godhead that came down. I've heard it God with a couple of angels. You know, I really, I'm not going to try to parse that out here. And I'm not sure that, that uh, you know, God give you revelation, great. But I'm not sure that that's, you know, man's tools are going to get us to the answer there. All I'm going to tell you is God appeared to Abraham. But remember what, what we need to understand. The fullness of God has not been revealed. Why? God said to Moses, if I showed myself in all my fullness to you, you will die. God said that. Hence, people get the idea that if you see God, you will die. Okay, but God doesn't always show up in all his fullness. In fact, he showed Moses his back parts so that it wasn't quite the whole thing. Moses got to see more than anybody else in the Old Testament. He got, I mean, wow, what a revelation of God. Okay, when he says no man has seen God at any time, let's understand we're talking about his fullness because we're going we're to understand this in a moment. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. This is the indwelling again. This is where the love comes from. If you love one another, it's a testimony. God dwells in you, and his love is perfected in you. Because as you walk in this love, as you walk in this way of God, perfection comes. Remember, mutual indwelling is not something you earn. You don't pray enough to get it. You don't, you don't read the Bible enough to get it. You don't get it because you graduated from Bible school. You get it because you received it as a free gift from Jesus, a free gift from the Father. He gives you mutual indwelling. Now walk in it. Now walk in it. What's an evidence you're walking in? Love one another. That's a huge evidence. And that love is perfected in you. You flow in it better. You learn to, to manifest it better. You learn to walk in it better. Hereby we know. Here's another one of those. You know, herein is love. Hereby know we that we dwell in him. How do we know this? And he in us. How with this mutual indwelling again? Because he has given us of his spirit. So here's another evidence. It's the spirit that he's given unto us. So I want to go back now to verse 12. And I want to look at this. No man has seen God at any time a little bit. John 1, 18 says the same thing. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Notice that. The Father had not been fully revealed. The Son came and fully revealed him. He came and declared him. How do we understand this? We understand this, that it's revealed in Christ Jesus. He said to Philip, have I been so long with you, Philip, and you've not known me? To see me is to see the Father. Because Philip said, show us the Father, and it suffices. He's remembering Moses. He's remembering. Just show me the Father, Philip said. I mean, he's zealous for God. 
And Jesus looks at him and says, do you not know me yet, Philip? I mean, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because he is the one who declares him. He's the one who declares the Father. Who did Jesus show us when he's walking on this earth? The Father. He said, I don't do anything, but what I see the Father do, I say nothing but what I hear the Father say. He, to see Jesus was to see the Father. So when we understand this, no man has seen God any time, don't get all crazy in it. Just understand the fullness of God is revealed in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> okay, Romans 5.5. 5. I want to read this scripture. And hope makes not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Hear that? Hereby we know we dwell in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. The, hope, the love of God is shed abroad by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. It's the same thing. Paul and John agree. This is what happens. So we understand now that the Spirit's been given to us to, to manifest that he's in me and I'm in him. Okay? This is how we know. This is what we see. This is what one of the manifestations of. is the manifestations of the Spirit. Let's look in John chapter 7. Verse 38. He that believes on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because the Jesus was not yet glorified. So when was the Holy Ghost given in this manner? Well, we know that. It's Acts chapter 2. In the end of Luke, uh, Jesus tells them, Go tarry in Jerusalem to be endued with power from on high. In Acts, it's, we're going to tarry in Jerusalem. And then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. This, that's the Spirit is given. Why is that important? Because so many people deny the manifestation of the Spirit in that way. There is a baptism in the Spirit. John testified that when Jesus, the one who comes after me, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Did he baptize anybody in the Holy Spirit while he was on earth? No, because he was manifesting the Father. But when he went back up, to be with his father, then he now becomes the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. And he poured out his spirit upon all flesh. He poured out his spirit upon the church, certainly. And they began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance. They began to move in power. He said, you cannot be my witnesses until this happens to you. You must have this. So, just to wrap this up, the fullness of God has been shown in Christ Jesus, and we know that that fullness dwells in us. We know that we dwell in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. Don't ever take away from that. Just you, that you gotta, you got to live there. you got to walk there. That is an important part of it. Verse 14. We have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And I put a scripture down there, the Savior of the world. John 4, 42, he's talking to the Samaritan woman, or as right after the woman at the well, and the people, the other Samaritans are talking to say, and said to the woman, now, well, now we believe, because Jesus came and ministered to them, not because of your saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So it's just another place where this same concept is used. So, we have seen, John says, and do testify the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. So remember in, in chapter 1, and we had, the, we had the scripture that said, I'm just going to read it so I get it exactly right. Don't get anybody confused. Go to 1 John chapter 1 and the end of it. He says, he says this. Uh, verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him, walk in darkness, we're liars. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ's Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar and the word is not in us. He's, he's emphasizing it from every angle, every understanding, so that everything gets covered. It's the same thing that he's doing here. He's saying again, God dwells in us and he in him and he in God. What is he talking about? Let's look at the parts of this. He says here in 15, if you confess that Jesus is the Son of God, there's a mutual indwelling. 
How do you know that you indwell him? Verse 13, because he's given us of his spirit. Right? Let's go up here to... Uh, um, oh, goodness, where is it? It's, it's in... You know, in verse 9, that we might live through him. Right? We talk about love. Go up a little bit further. Here we go. He that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Verse 2 of chapter 4. Is, is of God. Remember, we started this chapter with this concept, not to believe every spirit, but to understand that this mutual indwelling is important. So we start out by recognizing we can try the spirits because we can find out who says that Jesus is in them and, and, and they're in Jesus. That's just a, that's the beginning right there. This Because the, it's the Antichrist who denies that. Do you know most people deny that? They, or or they have a hard time dealing with it. So then we move down and he says, verse 4, you've overcome them because of who's in you. So there's a manifestation of this. You start off with confessing. You start off with believing it because it's what Jesus said. They speak of the world. They, they, they don't know us. How do you know the spirit of truth and spirit of Eric? Those that, that are with us that speak these same things, right? So then he says, tells us to love one another because the, we're supposed to live through him. Verse 9. I mean, this is the manifestation of this mutual indwelling, this life of God in me, right? Here in his love. Not that we love God, verse 10. He loved us and took everything away. We ought to do the same as him. So he says, if we love one another, God dwells in us. It's a manifestation. It's an, it, is a, it is a proof that God dwells in us. And hereby we know that he dwells in us because he's given us of his spirit. And then we go down here. If you confess that Jesus is the Son of God, verse 15, God dwells in him and he in God. He's giving us from every aspect what this mutual indwelling means. This thing that Jesus has done, he redeemed us, he cleansed us from sin, he gave us a new heart and a new spirit. He's done all of this for us, given it to us freely, freely the water of life if we just ask him if we're thirsty we ask him to drink out of our bellies flows rivers of living water he gives us of his spirit listen to this every has the same kind of thing every aspect of it from every angle helping us to understand this is the manifestation it's not that you earned it it's that he gave it freely it's not that just because he gave it freely if you deny it if you deny the faith if you speak against it you're not going to have it. You're going to lose it. You have to stay with it. You have to believe it. Confess it. Begin to say, he's in me. You go, well, I'm such a mess. I make so many mistakes. How could Jesus be in me? Stop with that. Don't go by the judgment of your eye. Begin to confess the truth. Then there are some who go out confessing, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. I do everything that God tells me to do. And they're committing sin. And we're learning from it. That's not the, the manifestation is there's going to be love. And in love, there's no sin. So do you understand this? That this, is, this whole section is helping us to know that the way that we walk is both to believe the word of God against all evidence to the contrary, and then to demand of the God, demand of the Spirit, Father, help me. Father, teach me. I want love to come out of my life. You know, when you ask God for things that are right, you know you have whatsoever you ask. And you ask according to his will, you have whatsoever we're asking. We, we think about that, and we're always thinking about miracles and signs and wonders, and that's great. But you know, it can be as simple as, Father, come and change me. Father, come and lead me. Father, come and guide me. Father, I submit my way to you today. Lord, I don't know what I'm doing today. Father, I'm, I, maybe I'm completely confused. But Father, I'm asking you to lead me and to guide me. I mean, when I was a very young in the Lord, I knew nothing. God led me. All I did was ask him to, and he led me by a miracle in ways that I didn't know where I was going. He led me to the right places. He knew what I needed, and as long as I was willing to follow him, he was willing to make it happen. And I might say, well, I made good choices. No, I really didn't. I wasn't making great choices. I was asking God to lead me and to guide me, and God basically foisted choices upon me that I embraced, and they worked out 
to some of the greatest things that have ever happened in my life, to, to lead me and to set me up to where I am today. The, these are the things that God did that had nothing to do with my smarts or my abilities. They had to do with him honoring my cry because of the mutual indwelling I could not have expressed, but was living in because of what he did and began to hate evil. He began to show me to hate evil. And that was the beginning. It's, it's the beginning of wisdom. It's the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. You begin to recognize, I don't like evil. I don't like anything about it. I don't like evil in me and I don't like evil in you. I don't like evil. God will teach you to hate it. That's walking with him. And when you walk with him, he teaches you to love. Never had a problem with that. You know, you, you could, you, people might point to things, oh, you didn't love good enough here. And yeah, praise God, he's correcting me a minute. But in general, all I wanted to do was love people. Who did that? God did that in me. He did that. He put that in me. He put that in anybody who's born again. Some men, through the working of their own mind and the, and the struggles of their own life, will sear that conscience. They will sear what's going on with them. They will harden their heart against the word of God because they will be taught or they will choose to go in the way of Cain, to go in the way of sin. And it's a terrible thing. So enough on that. Just wanted you guys to understand this mutual and dwelling understanding is absolutely essential to understanding this book. John is telling us what Jesus did and what we choose all we have to choose is to walk in his way. You do not have to figure it all out. I spent many years after that trying to figure it all out. And it was when I recognized that when I knew the least, that the biggest miracles of God's leading happened in my life. And you go, oh my, that's a problem. And so you begin to say, let me be a little child again, Father. Let me just be like a little child and you lead me and you guide me and you show me. And I tell you, he will. He'll make opportunity. Just be willing. Don't have any self-aggrandizement. Make yourself nothing as Jesus did. Walk in meekness and lowliness and humbleness of mind and say, Father, do with me what you want to do and take no thought for your life, what you will wear, what you will put on, where you will live. Take no thought for it. Just give yourself to following God. Okay, so... Just to say 15 again, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. That's how simple it is. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Right? Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, you'll be saved. Verse 16. We have known and believed the love that God has to us. We have known this love. We believe this love that he sent his Son to be the Savior of the world, to be the one who takes away our sin, the one who makes a way of forgiveness. All things that Jesus did for us. God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God. Oh, let love be the first manifestation. That's why Paul said, I show you in a more excellent way. Let me tell you, it's about love. Love, 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 love. And you dwell in God and God dwells in you. Herein, there's another one of those. Is our love made perfect? Oh, yes, Lord, I want perfect love. This is what I want. Lord, I want you to do this in me. This is what I want. Perfect love. Oh, Lord, I want that. Here's a, herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Here it is. You want to know what the secret is? As he is, so are we in this world. Oh, you mean the more I submit myself to Jesus in me, and me and him, that that's how my love is made perfect? Herein's love made perfect. So you can have boldness in the day of judgment. When that day comes, because as he is, so are we in this world. There it is. That's it. I confess this. I live this. I eat this. I breathe this. I wake with it. I go to sleep with it. Christ in me and me in him, not by any works of righteousness that I've done. But because of that, I want to walk without sin. Because of that, I want to walk in perfect love. <clears throat> this is the love that God has to us. Okay? It harkens back to verse 12. Just put a little note there for you. Our love is made perfect. 
How? Because we are as he is. It just that is how our love is made perfect. It's not made perfect by what you do. It's made perfect by you letting Jesus live in you. As he is, so are we in this world. Verse 18. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. Now, these are different fears, by the way. Just different words. I don't know if we need to make too much of that. But if you look at the first one, there's no fear in love. John 14, 27 uses that first same word. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, give I to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. It, it It's understanding. Because if you go and you look at this word fear and you go look it up, you're going to find a whole thing about fear God. That's not a bad thing. Fearing God is not a bad thing. Is he saying that in love you don't have to fear God? No, he's not saying that. But when we get to the one that says feareth, we're going to get a little bit better idea of what he's talking. He that fears is not made perfect in love. What is he really talking about? Matthew 10, 28. Don't fear them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. So that's, there's a place for your fear to be. Fear God. Fear God, the fear of the Lord, is the beginning of wisdom. And the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. So the beginning of wisdom is to hate evil, right? So you don't fear them that kill the body. That's the fear that there's no fear in love. You're not afraid of men who are going to kill your body, but they can't kill your soul. But your fear the one who can do both. That is God. So fear God. Do not fear men. So when he says there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, he's not talking about the fear of God. He's talking about the fear of men. Let's look at another one. Matthew 14, 27. Straightway Jesus spake to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Don't be afraid. That You don't have to be afraid of this, guys. This is not something to be afraid of. Another one. In Luke 8.50, when Jesus heard it about this, the need that has, right? The, the man needs his daughter to be healed. He answered him saying, do not fear. Believe only. She shall be made whole. So listen to what we're talking about. Fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. What is the torment? The torment is the fear. It's like, I, I'm not certain God's going to come through. I'm not certain God will do for me. I'm not, I'm not certain that I can believe him and trust him. I'm, I'm just not certain that it's going to work out for me. That kind of fear is that, that messes with love. You need to understand that God's love for you is so great that when you were yet a sinner, he died for you. How much more the children of God, those that have been made his people, how much more is he going to take care of you? If he clothes the, the grass of the field and he feeds the young lions and the sparrows, is he not going to take care of you? Oh, you of little faith. Understand that. Okay? As we, we quoted earlier, this is the victory that overcomes the world. Even our faith is going to come in the next chapter. There's, a, there's something beyond believing, in a sense. Because he says up here, he says that um, we have known and believed the love. Okay, that's good. You want your love to now to be perfect? Walk as he walked. As he is, so are we. That's how you get your love perfect, right? And there's no fear in it. That means there's no doubt. There's no, there's no place of where you think God isn't going to come through for you. It's all taken care of. Perfect love casts out the fear. When you're walking in the perfect love, when you're walking as he is, you're not a bit concerned. You're not a bit worried. You know what causes worry and concern? When you want your own way and you're hoping that God will overlook it. You know, he, he, he doesn't mind. That will cause trouble. It'll mess with you. So how do I fix that? You know, how do I get? How do I make that better? Because I'll be honest with you, you can't fix it, but you can recognize it, and you can go down on your knees, and you can cry out to God, saying, "Father, help me. Forgive me. I believe. Help my unbelief." That, very simple. Ask of Him. You will have what you ask. When you ask according to his will. He hears us. We have whatsoever we ask of him. As you begin to walk in that, you begin to trust him. Now you're going to be able to hear the words of knowledge and the direction of God that's going to show you 
where the needs are and how to pray. And you're going to begin to see the manifestation of the miracles in a greater way than you've ever seen. I've seen miracles. I've seen things happen. I've seen people get healed. I've seen things I've prayed for absolutely happen. I've seen all of it happen. But I'm telling you, there's a greater manifestation of it. Well, how do I get there? Do I earn it? No. I ask him. I become passionate for it. And I ask him. I become desirous of it. And I ask him. And when I ask him, I receive so let's get to the end here of chapter 4. Verse 19 says this, We love him, we love him, because he first loved us. Always it's that way. Everything that I ever do in love, it's because he loved me. It's because he dwells in me. If a man says, I love God, and he hates his brother, he's a liar. And we saw this earlier. We looked at James about it. We looked at a bunch of other scriptures on it. He hates his brother. He's a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Who? How can you say that? You say, I love God, but you don't love your brethren. It doesn't make any kind of sense. And this commandment have we from him. He who loves God loves his brother also. There it is. Who's your brother? Whosoever is called upon the name of the Lord Jesus, fundamentally. Do you love the world? Do we go out and into the world to see people get saved? Absolutely. But he's talking here mainly just about loving the, the people of God. I mean, we got so much division and fighting and warring and arguing in the people of God. I mean, goodness gracious, that just should not be. Paul said it shouldn't be this way. Love your brother. That's the beginning. It's, it's, what, it's what no man should have to teach you. You know how to do this. You love the people of God. And if you, you, you know, loving them that love you should be easy. It really should be easy. Because then from that, your love is made perfect and you can begin to love those that hate you. And you can be loved those that despitefully use you. You know, and, and those that mistreat you. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those that curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. This is Jesus. This is what Jesus taught us to do. This is what he said to do. <clears throat> so he says, if you say you love God and you hate your brother, you're lying. You're lying. And we've heard that before. This is, a, this is another summary statement of whatever is going on. And we're going to move next time into chapter 5. And chapter 5 is, is uh, just, just packed full of stuff. Um, and it, it just begins to take these same themes and pound them home. Pound them home. Make them as clear as they could possibly be. So be blessed. Study these things hard. Listen to things that we've emphasized. Um, stuff like that will be on the test. I want you to be able to go and tease out. I tried to get you. I haven't read them yet, but I tried to get you to go in and take the love of God and look at all the things about the love of God and build yourself a little sermon. Just a, just a little simple thing that you can say that you just know it. You know this is what the Word of God says about love one another in in first john i also want you to be able to do the same thing about the mutual indwelling I want you to find all the places write them all out look at them meditate upon them cry out to god say thank you for this that you've given unto me so that you can speak about the mutual indwelling i want you to be able to do that and the other one i want you to look at here is in verse 20 you, if you say you love god and you hate your brother you're a liar that's repeated throughout these first four chapters. I want you to dig through and I want you to find, read the whole book and just mark all these are the places where he tells us to do that. Remember we talked about Cain and he emphasized this to, to love, but you, if you hate your brother, it's a manifestation that you do not love God. You just don't. You're a liar. You don't. You need to love your brother. And you say, well, yeah, but he mistreated me. He just, he treated me bad, mistreated me. Doesn't mean you shouldn't love him. It just doesn't mean that. Forgive. Be as Jesus was. So be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with love. Be honorable in all things. Perfect love will cast out all the doubt, all the unbelief, all the fear. It'll cast it out. Perfect love. You come to know, we know the love of God. Paul was crying out that I may know him in the fellowship of his sufferings. He was, Lord, I want to know you. And we need to be crying the same, Lord, I want to know you. And one of the biggest manifestations, first manifestations you have, love one another. So look around you. Look at your, your friends, your 
loved ones in Bible school and just fall in love all over again. And then begin to love the people that you meet day after day after day. The people that you're trying to draw in. The people that you're calling to come to Jesus. Begin to love them like you've never loved before. Not to argue with them, not to fight with them, to love them. And ask the Lord to teach you how to love them like you've never loved them before. Because this is the manifestation. And I tell you, when you ask God for it, when you're passionate about it, and you want to receive it, you will receive it. Amen. Be blessed, and we'll see you next time.